The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and the arts. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of racism, segregation, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. With us today is Patricia Cruz, who's the executive director of Harlem Stage, located in Harlem. Hi, Pat. Glad to have you with us Hi, today. Hi. I'm thrilled to be here. Now, we've been working on the arts for a long time, mm -hmm. and you've been working on the arts for a long time. Now, tell us about Harlem Stage, what it is, how it got started, and then we'll talk about some of the things that you do there. I'd be happy to. Um, Harlem Stage actually was previously known as Aaron Davis Hall, Inc., and we started in one of the buildings on City College campus. Now, Aaron Davis Hall was a concert hall right on the campus. Absolutely, and it was a facility that had been built in 1979 mm -hmm. for performance by community artists mm -hmm. and by students. But one of the big missions was to bring professional arts at accessible and affordable prices to the Harlem community. And what happened was Aaron Davis Hall, Inc., the group, the nonprofit group that ran Aaron Davis Hall, fulfilled that part of the mission. And so increasingly, as the economy back in 79 got bad, there was a greater degree of responsibility that we had, Aaron Davis Hall, Inc., in running, managing, and fundraising for those programs in Aaron Davis Hall. I remember at Aaron Davis Hall, you had Dizzy Gillespie, you had uh, oh, Tito Ella Puente. Fitzgerald, Tito Puente. We had uh, Harry Belafonte. They, We've honored so many artists, mm -hmm. Nancy Wilson. Um, it was an incredible facility and remains that. Mm -hmm. And we named one of the halls there, the largest hall, the Marian Anderson Theater. Mm -hmm. And to continue the great tradition of what the legacy that Harlem had on world culture. Mm -hmm. So um, we did that and we've done it for over 20 years. And finally what happened was um, City College came back in terms of its interest in the building and started to use more and more of the space. At the same time, our board very wisely thought, well, maybe we should have a space of our own. Mm -hmm. So over 10 years ago, we started to look for that space and found one right across the street in the Croton Aqueduct Gatehouse that sat on one of the highest points in Manhattan a at 135th. A lot of people don't know that there was a big aqueduct there. Yeah. where the water for New York used to come in yes. and has to be pumped through that station. And actually, it was not a pumping station. It was a gatehouse, Gate Roman, mm -hmm. Roman architecture and technology mm -hmm. in which the gates were lifted mm -hmm. so that water would come from the big stone um, tunnels that were coming in from the Croton mm -hmm. into pipes that mm -hmm. led right across the street at what was Bryant Park at 42nd Street, mm -hmm. used to be one of the reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So um, it had a great tradition of flowing clean water to New York when people were dying here of waterborne diseases over 100 years ago. So it was an abandoned, um, historically a landmarked building that had been abandoned for over 20 years. It was completely dilapidated and an eyesore in the community. We were able, with our community board, with our elected officials, with artists and with the, the community people, actually, parents and teachers that were in our community came together to help us to transform this space into a state-of-the-art theater now known as the Harlem Stage Gatehouse. Well, one of the issues at that time was what was going to be done when the, the gatehouse was restored. And the idea of coming to the arts, yes. I guess, was your idea. Yeah, well, we actually transformed it and restored it. We got a Lucy Moses Award for Preservation mm -hmm. because it was one of the best restorations of an old building that had been abandoned but really transformed into something that we felt culture and art could flow mm -hmm. from where water had once flown. Now, how did you decide on the emphasis of your arts, whether it's going to be drama, music, dance, or whatever? We've mixed it up always. This has been a multidisciplinary um, organization, and we are a presenting organization who has supported artists of color 
primarily in the development of new work. And that new work builds on the tradition of Harlem's great, rich cultural tradition. So these are younger artists, primarily emerging artists, in some instances more better known artists, who are developing new work. And we assist in that process. We assist through commissioning as well as the presentation of those works and then, of course, the promotion of it. But it's in all forms, dance, music, theater, um, primarily are the forms that all of the performing arts. Now, do you work with educational institutions to provide training, or is this a place where once you're trained, you show off your work? Yes, these are artists who are fully established, and when I say emerging, it's because they're not known by the mm -hmm. larger society necessarily, but people like Roger Genvere Smith are better known. Mm -hmm. People like Sekou Sundiata, the late artist mm -hmm. who we presented in our opening um, of the Gatehouse back in 2006. Bilty Jones, who of course mm -hmm. is probably one of the best known of the artists who are doing new work. Uh, so we support that work, and we support it through commissioning the work and allowing them rehearsal space, rehearsal time, time in front of audience as they're doing works in, in progress, for example, before we premiere a work. Um, we do offer educational programs, however. So we are educating the youth in our community, primarily the grade schools who come in to see these performances and are inspired by the work of these artists. And now what we're doing also, Dr. Brown, is sending artists into the schools for more concentrated uh, learning experience so they can be inspired by creativity, essentially. Well, how much of this work is focused on drama, music, the creative arts, I would dance? say that, that you know, certainly a uh, hundred percent of our work is focused on all of that, yeah. but in terms of percentages between the disciplines, mm -hmm. I would say that probably our greatest emphasis is in music and theater, I mean in dance, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, because that has been the form uh, that we have. Um, but you have done plays. I think we I've have. seen some plays. And some of the plays have been in partnership. One of the things that I think we do best is to have partnerships with other organizations. We've worked with the Classical Theater of Harlem. Most recently, mm -hmm. we did Their Three Sisters. Prior to that, Trojan Women. And Roger Genvere Smith's work has been theater. Uh, so he did a piece called Who Shot Bob Marley? Who Killed mm -hmm. Bob Marley? Yeah. Um, in our opening sequence. Mm -hmm. And Sekou Sundiata's work, The 51st Dream State, was really um, a multimedia performance mm -hmm. piece that could have been considered theater, mm -hmm. but it had music and spoken word, of course. So that has been a, a primary part of what we've done. But I think more frequently with programs like eMoves, our emerging choreographer series, um, we've done a lot of dance, and we continue to do that. And, of course, music. We have a great new series that we're doing called Harlem Stride. And well, you I have think one also called Uptown Nights at yeah, Harlem Stage. Yeah, and that's our newest series. And that is a combination of music primarily and spoken word because we found that many of these young artists are really blending forms mm -hmm. in a great way. We had some groups there just uh, this past several weeks um, on the Uptown Night series. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was Tamar Kali presented a group called Her Own Construct, uh, Cabaret Chocolat. Mm -hmm. And she had all of these performances, sold out audiences. We had to turn people away. And while I hate turning people away, it was wonderful to see so many people interested to see this art. And it is art. It is art but it's also performance, it's entertaining, it's enlightening. Now, she how has do you let people know? Do you do it on the internet, you do it on the radio, you do it in the newspaper? We use the most affordable forms, mm -hmm. and primarily we are doing a lot of web-based things. So we have a fabulous new website. People can reach out to us at... What is the website address? www.harlemstage.org. That's pretty easy. That's pretty <laughs> easy. and. In that way, you get to see all of the upcoming programs, and we'll be launching our new season January 1st, mm -hmm. so it's not up right now. But we've done um, everything from films with the Black Collective, mm -hmm. um, Black Documentary Collective, which has been wonderful, to this Uptown Night series, again, music attracting young people. 
On March 26th, we have Tamara Kali and actually the Black Rock Coalition. She'll be doing some of the orchestrations and the singing, but with a whole group of fantastic artists, including an all-women orchestra, in a tribute to Nina Simone. Yeah, who is developing the All Women Orchestra? Yes, that's the Black Rock Coalition. Oh, is it? And so that's another organization with whom we're working, revived music. Uh, we're working with them as well. We're also doing some pieces with uh, Columbia Harlem Jazz Project, mm -hmm. and they've been supportive of our, of our work, as has most recently George Ween with Care Fusion. So we have um, made a lot out of a little in terms of our own resources by combining and working with these other entities to present great art. Now, how large is uh, Harlem Stage? What's your uh, capacity? Harlem Stage is <laughs> relatively small based on what we were doing at Marian Anderson. Mm -hmm. Harlem Stage is seats up to 200. Mm -hmm. So it's an intimate space in which people get a chance to be almost as close to the artist as I am mm -hmm. to you. And it's a fabulous experience and I think it's very rare and unusual. Um, in with, with the Nina Simone tribute, we'll be back at, at Aaron Davis Hall in the Marian Anderson mm -hmm. Theater, appropriately, um, because it has a larger orchestra, a larger stage mm -hmm. need, and can fit more people. We can get close to 700 people in that theater. Now, what nights of the week do you actually have performances? Um, it depends. <laughs> we're Uptown nights we're doing on Saturday nights because we think that's a good night for... Saturday, um, night, Saturday night in Harlem. <laughs> that's right, darling. <laughs> and people can come within the old tradition because you know what we found, Dr. Brown, and I was kind of disgruntled about this. Many of our Harlemites, especially the young folks, were going to Brooklyn to have a good time. And we felt, you got to come here, mm -hmm. because we feel that there's such an inspiration, and now it's catching on, they're there, and again, they'll be there for March 26th with the Nina Simone tribute, but we're doing a lot of things before that. We have another big series that we put together. That's our commissioning program, and I talked about the way that we support... By commissioning, what do you mean? It means that we give artists fees that, uh, and it's not just a fee, it's a commissioning um, grant, essentially, that enables them to develop their work. So these commissioning fees can go anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000, depending upon the size of the work. So we have commissioned various artists. The first four artists that we worked with I mentioned earlier, it included Tanya Leon, uh, Sekou Sundiata, Roger Genvir Smith, and Bill T. Jones. This round of artists, we are beginning um, with Deirdre Murray, I don't know if you know her, mm -hmm. a fabulous cellist who's doing mm -hmm. a vocal ensemble. She's an orchestrator right. and a musician called The Voice Within. But coming up, February 10th, we have a program that I'm really excited about, and I think you will be too. Um, Vijay Iyer, who's a wonderful Indian American mm -hmm. pianist, mm -hmm. and Mike Ladd, uh, a poet who's a great writer. I love his work. Um, they are collaborating on a new work, which we are commissioning. And you'd be happy to know that this is on, they're taking stories of the vets of color, veterans for, of color from Afghanistan and mm -hmm. Iraq. That is interesting. And talking about their dreams. Mm -hmm. So they're going to put that into a theatrical and, and musical performance. Uh, which I'm so looking forward to, because these are stories, especially for artists of, of vet veterans of color, that have been largely ignored. Some of your work has been critically reviewed in many of the major publications. Yes. Uh, they like the idea that it's avant-garde, that it's opening the doors. Yes. But what do you do with the schools? How does that relate to what you're doing with your performances? Well, what we do is we bring these schools in. We serve over 10,000 children a year coming mm -hmm. through the doors of Harlem Stage and Marian Anderson Theater to see first-rate art. So, in fact, we just had a large group there seeing Dana Leon, who's a, a cellist mm -hmm. and a musician, who's combining his musical talents with hip hop, the kids were off the hook because it was something that they could relate to. Mm -hmm. But we're also doing classical dance that they're looking at. We have ballet Hispanico that comes in. So they're really seeing the richness of the creations of artists of color 
across the board. So whether it's dance, whether it's Latino, whether it's African American, we're really inspiring them, we think, with artists who are thinking creatively, exploring creatively, because for me, art is about ideas. It's about who we are, mm -hmm. how we kind of see the larger world, and what our level of interaction is with it, and what our responsibilities are to it. Well, your enthusiasm comes through very well. Now, yeah. if I'm watching and I want to get a ticket to one of your functions, how would I get in touch with you? You, um, you could call our box office Which at 212-281-9240, extension 19. Um, and you'll come right in and be able to, and you can also s come into uh, Harlem Stage at 150 Convent Avenue, right on the corner of 135th Street. See our fabulous new building. The renovation is wonderful. It's like a little castle. People can come in and buy tickets, or they can go online, um, which is, for many people, the easiest way nowadays. So they go to www.harlemstage.org, see all of the programs, click Buy Now, and they're in. Now, all this takes money, and I'm sure that <coughs> yeah. you have a lot of donors and supporters. How do you raise your money for this pro uh, program? Well, we've been very fortunate. I think that in this downtime, we've had a really stable uh, budget and system of support. We've gotten historically great money from um, our government agencies, particularly the Department of Cultural Affairs, and as you may know, uh, the city was in instrumental in our construction of the mm -hmm. gatehouse. They gave us the primary support. It is a city-owned building. For the rehabilitation, for Absolutely. the renovation. Absolutely, right? yes. And they're giving us money for operating as well. So we have a great deal of fondness mm -hmm. um, for both the mayor and the commissioner of cultural affairs. They've been incredibly supportive. And we also get monies from the state, the city, uh, the state and the feds, the National Endowment for the Arts supports us. More significantly recently, some of our higher, higher donations have come from foundations like the Ford Foundation um, and any number of other foundations that support our work. Corporations have been really important to us. Our whole Waterworks series was sponsored by Time Warner. Um, Bloomberg has supported our eMove series. Because these folks believe in creativity, they believe in having communities enriched by this art. So we have that. And now our final frontier, and our board has also been very supportive Ooh, of our Who's the chairman of your board? A.C. Hudgens. You might know the name because yeah. he's an old Harlem family. Yeah. Um, so A.C. has led us and very happily. We've got some new board members in. I don't know if you know Olivia Smasham. Mm -hmm who's with HBO, Jeanette mm -hmm. Kahn. We have a, a wonderful board mm -hmm. who's really stepped up to support our activities. And now we're doing what major institutions across the country have done very well, which is to get the support of individuals. We're developing a commissioning circle so that as we do commissioning of these artist programs that I'm talking about, we also want to get individuals in, to come in as a part of the commissioning process so they can help us to enable these artists to make new works. How do you select the artists? Um, we look around. Mm -hmm. We rely a lot on um, artists that we've really worked with. But I've got a young team now. Um, Brad Lermont is our director of programs. He's done an extraordinary job of working with me. And we've kind of put our heads together in terms of looking at who's out there, who we would be interested in. A primary part of, of who we select as artists are artists who believe, as we do, in the transformative power of art. Well, how do you find them? Just from people who are your well, friends or people who well, refer we, them to we you? We go out to performances. We mm -hmm. are engaged mm -hmm. in organizations like Association for Performing Arts Presenters. So we see works in showcase and are identifying artists that way. And then we get out and see works all the time. And we've got some new, some younger staff members. Simone Eccleston is one of my younger uh, staff. She's our program manager. She runs our education program. And she goes out every night to check things out and bring new artists in. How large is your staff? Fifteen. Mm -hmm. We're pretty tight and small for an organization that does as much as we do. Um, but they're all smart, all hardworking, and I love the fact that we have a wonderful age range 
and um, the folks are really dedicated to this idea of, again, art mm -hmm. and it being a core and culture being a core value that can sustain our community. Well, this staff includes your technical staff, your yes. lighting no, and sound and that's, so on? That's additional. We have a mm -hmm. tech crew and we also have a technical <coughs> coordinator. And so those are the people who run the theaters. Mm -hmm. We also have a leasing program when you talked about how we bring money in. Mm -hmm. So earned income is a part of what we do. And these partnerships, we're so working. So if somebody wanted to have a wedding, they could do it there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd call Ada Reyes, and uh, yeah, that would be what would be happening. Uh, so we're doing everything that we can to not only survive but to thrive because we feel like that's what we have to do. And these partnerships have been very, very important with us as now, well. Now, there's the Harlem Arts Alliance and Rosa yes. Rivers. Are you yes. part of that as well? And we absolutely are, and I was just there um, we did a program that Michael Unthank arranged at the Harlem Arts Alliance, and we were looking at um, how to increase the stability, financial stability, mm -hmm. using your mission, how your mission then plays out into your programs, and doing some of the same things you've asked mm -hmm. me about, how you move from sustaining an organization to making it thrive through your fundraising, through your promotion of your programs. How are you making the public aware of what you do? And that's been very important. We have we send out e-blasts so people and we we are building those lists. So everybody that comes through the door, we know how to get to them because it's less expensive also mm -hmm. than doing mailings. We still do that. But um, you know, we want people to go on our website, sign up become members, but also just sign up so that they can get the information to know what we're doing and to be a part of our extended family. Now, how do you relate to groups like the Harlem School of the Arts? Well, certainly, Harlem School of the Arts has been one of our primary partners in doing programs in um, Marian Anderson Theater. So they are in Aaron Davis Hall. They have done their annual um, performances with mm -hmm. us. Dance Theater of Harlem has done mm -hmm. so as well. Jazzmobile, we're doing a lot of new programming with them. We're actually doing a new collaboration with the Apollo. We've got... What a, are you doing with the Apollo? We're doing a program called Jazz Shrines, and it's going to be a couple of years down the line. But with Jazzmobile and the Apollo and Harlem Stage, we are together going to honor um, the jazz shrines that were so instrumental um, to to um, to music in Harlem, and we are going to be celebrating. In fact, Fats Waller through the music of Jason Moran. He's building a whole new piece that we're commissioning, and um, mm -hmm. it'll be a dance party because he wants to do it in the oldest tradition of the Harlem Stride, where people got together, heard great music, danced to it, and enjoyed in a really um, intrinsic way these contributions and these creati crea the creativity of these artists. Well, some of this should be in a publication. Do you Have you thought about doing a publication we with have, some of the pictures and the narrative about what you're doing? We've not done that, but it's a great idea. A lot of what we've been doing is historically archived now, and we're doing more of these archives on the website so that people can go to them, they can download them. But you're right. We also need, and, and that's a good thing for mm -hmm. us to think about on our side. We're talking about doing a newsletter, but it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. To put together um, a publication that actually lays out the richness that Harlem had, mm -hmm. uh, the tradition of the music, the dance, the writing that came out of Harlem, and how we as contemporaries of, of this particular time an artist of this particular time can build on that so that it's not a dying thing. It's completely dynamic but and fluid. You did say Harlem had. Uh, I would like to say Harlem has. You're absolutely in, right. In uh, American world culture, Harlem is seen as the epicenter of creativity of black art, although it's in Brooklyn now and Queens and Chicago and Baltimore and so on. Yeah. Now, what, what are you doing to help promote that idea that uh, 
culture and music and dance is alive in Harlem. How do you do that? Everything we do, all each and every program that we do has that as its thesis. So um, as we present uh, emerging choreographers or as we present Tamar Kali, for example, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sorry, the Black Rock Coalition with the music that they're doing for Nina Simone, um, there is an incredible kind of playback, if you will, between what happened, and you're absolutely right to correct me, Harlem had, Harlem still has, um, this great rich tradition, and we're constantly building it. So every program that we does, that we do, asserts that. So um, we, we are publicizing it in that way when mm -hmm. we write about it on our website, when we write about it in our programs, we're putting forth that thesis. Well, as we come to the close of the program, if you had one message you'd want to send to our viewers, what would that message be? It would be come to the Harlem Stage Gatehouse, be inspired by the creativity of emerging and young and master artists who are giving their all so that we can all be lifted up um, and inspired by art. Which means to buy tickets and make donations and let other people know about <laughs> it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's what that means. You're my translator, right? <laughs> That's right. Today on African American Legends, we've been talking with Patricia Cruz, who's the executive director of Harlem Stage, located in the village of Harlem. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you.